just get started now. Dr. Baker is here to speak about um, different things to do with MS relapse. And for that, though, I want you all to know that we are supported to do our programs. And today we are supported by Malincrot, who's the maker of Akthar. And we should give that lady over there a hand because she helped us to do this program today. That's Leslie from Malincrot. Don't blush. <laughs> okay. So Dr. Baker is going to explain about understanding MS relapse, a little bit about the signs and the symptoms, and the different treatments that there are available. You're going to speak for how long? An hour? 40 minutes? 35 minutes? Maybe 45 minutes. Okay, great. And then you'll do Q&A with them, right? And then you'll be out in like an hour, okay? Great. Let's get started. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. You're welcome. Thank you. Here's your uh, clicker. You're not such a bad guy for a Yankee. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> Welcome to uh, rural America. So thank you. I, I like doing these programs because I get to, to make my own slide deck. And when we do promotional programs for pharmaceutical companies, I have to use their slide deck. So this is, um, this is my puppy, Kaya. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, this is my puppy, Kaya. And so Kai is going to be sprinkled in through the presentation. So um, here's our agenda. So um, we're going to talk about uh, what a relapse is and, and importantly, what it isn't. Um, you know, thinking about a relapse, the original description of MS as a relapsing condition dates back to its original description with uh, Jean Martin Charcot in the late 1800s. So he's, he's, he said that relapses were uh, a period of neurological worsening or a new neurologic symptom that occurred uh, after a period of, of stabilization. And, and so the definition really dates back to that, that time. Uh, and, and we most MS is, is that of a relapsing course, uh, and then it may go into a, a progressive form of the illness uh, with or without uh, additional uh, disease activity. Um, Stuart asked me to talk a little bit about what the role of MRI is in the analysis or the evaluation of, of relapse. How do we use MRI? And then how do we treat MS relapses? What options are available to address uh, MS relapses? So most MS talks start with a slide like this. And um, I stole this slide um, from, from Dr. Fox. And um, we, we know that it starts even before we have symptoms of MS. There's a preclinical phase. So uh, oftentimes when we see patients who have multiple sclerosis, they present with the first clinical event. But when you look at their MRI, you see that there have been lesions that have occurred without uh, them being aware of it. So there's a so-called um, preclinical phase. And then there are these episodes or periods where there are new neurologic symptoms that come and they last for a while and then they, they recover. Uh, but then with time, there's increasing clinical disability. Even in the preclinical phase, you start to lose volume of brain and then the disease burden over time increases. But early on, you see this MRI activity and then as time goes on, you see less and less MRI activity. So th those are the things that we see clinically and radiographically uh, in, in multiple sclerosis over the course of, of many years. And these are the different types of MS. So we all recognize that there's a relapsing remitting form of multiple sclerosis. Um, then we've uh, learned more recently about secondary progressive MS. But even if you've been labeled with a progressive form of MS, you can have um, relapses on, on top of that. So there is um, secondary prog progressive MS with disease activity and secondary progressive MS without disease activity, uh, so active or non-active. And then there's a special type of multiple sclerosis called primary progressive where you don't really see relapses. But that can be tricky too because the um, the course of the disease can 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 progressively get get worse and then stabilize, and then you may have 
a, a sudden uh, worsening, but it's not really an acute relapse. It's just a, a, a progression of disease. So that makes it confusing when you're trying to identify what a relapse is and what, what it isn't. So here's Kaya, at, at, um, she's a little older in this picture. And uh, I just love her, her pink nose and her, her coloring there and her, her little paws. I don't have any pictures of my, of my kids in this slide deck, so don't tell them that. So um, we've talked about this before. I know all of you here, and, and I, I've tried to drill into your minds uh, the definition of a relapse. And, and I like this term. I made this up. I call it a, a real lapse. So is it a real lapse or is it not a, a real lapse? Or, um, and, and it's defined by any new neurological symptom that lasts for 24 hours or more, um, or an old symptom that gets worse that lasts for 24 or more hours in the absence of something that we understand normally makes our MS symptom worse. And those things um, we all, all recognize and we'll talk about that in a second. Now, um, the, the, uh, it has to occur within, th you know, outside of 30 days from the, from the last relapse. And that makes sense because it could be the same relapse that's just worsening or because there can be a, there can be fluctuations in the symptoms over that 30-day period, or it it can be what we term a multifocal relapse. So uh, it's still the same relapse, but you might have left leg weakness and right eye visual loss. But if it's within that 30-day period, it's considered to be the same relapse. It's just affecting two different parts of the of the nervous system. And ideally, you should have a neurological examination that finds some objective evidence of a change in your neurological status. And we measure neurologic status by a special scale called the Expanded Disability Status Scale. And within that scale, we have certain functional system evaluations, and we have special definitions of defining relapses in clinical trials based on that. So if you have a change in your functional status scale in one functional area, of two or more, then that is consistent with a relapse. Or if you have a change of one or more in two functional uh, systems, that's considered to be consistent with a relapse. So if we have a real apps, what's the opposite of that? Well, we have a, you know, the, uh, a fake apps or uh, what we call a pseudo uh, relapse. What are some other terms for, for relapses, MS relapses? Episode, that's a good one, yeah. Exacerbation. Exacerbation. Who said exacerbation? You get bonus points for actually pronouncing it correctly. <laughs> most people say, and most nurses say, like, exasperation, which kind of fits, too. Yeah, you hear that. Um, fl anybody hear the term flare-up? Yeah, so MS flare, episode, um, exacerbation or exasperation. But in order to be uniform, we, we really talk about re relapses. So these are, these are things that, that cause a fake apps or, or a pseudo relapse. So overheating can cause old symptoms to get worse. Uh, stress can cause old symptoms to get worse. Fatigue, sleep deprivation. Um, perhaps a new medication is added that might have a side effect that causes you to feel poorly and think about this being a relapse. Infection, like a urinary tract infection, is, is a big trigger for a pseudo uh, relapse. Um, alcohol can, can make symptoms of, uh, of MS uh, worse. So one, one example would be if you have some spasticity in your leg and you'd had some prior weakness in the leg, but it's a little tight and it's harder to walk, so your doctor gives you a muscle relaxer. So the muscle relaxer sometimes can make you too loose and the leg gets weak and so it feels like you're having a, a relapse. But it's really due to the medication. All right. So this is, this is my dog, this is Kaya. This is Kaya's half-sister and they're a week apart. And this, this dog, her name is Bindi after, they're Australian Shepherds. And Bindi is named after um, Steve Irwin's daughter, Bindi Irwin. But Bindi has a middle name, and Bindi's middle name is Rupert for a girl, R-U-E-P-E-R-T. So now we call her Rupert, and it's just happened. 
But um, I, I like to, so my daughter and I, we, we have like competitions of whose dog is the better dog, and my dog's better than her dog. So. <laughs> yeah. But R Rupert's a good dog. Rupert is her emotional support dog. Rupert is the most emotionally needy animal I've ever met. She has extreme separation ang anxiety. She yeah, doesn't like the car, doesn't like the airplane. But my dog's better, yeah. So. <laughs> All right, so how often do relapses occur? And this has changed. This is fascinating data. So um, when we were first doing clinical trials on disease-modifying therapies, uh, we saw relapse rates, uh, you know, maybe one or two per year. Um, and uh, and that's the, um, the contemporary placebo rate is like now one every other year. So if you look at all these newer clinical trials and you look at the placebo group, so these are untreated patients, not on disease-modifying therapy, they, they have about one relapse every other year. So that's not as common as, say, 25 or 30 years ago when people were having two relapses a year, or at least one relapse a year. Now, in those patients who are treated on disease-modifying therapies, you would think our goal is to not have relapses. That's our primary endpoint. In those patients who are treated in clinical trials, uh, the, um, there's a, a relapse rate of about 37%. So 37% of those patients on disease-modifying therapies during the clinical trials, on average, will have a relapse. So relapses do occur despite very good, very effective treatments for um, multiple sclerosis. This is a concept called NIDA, no evidence of disease activity, and there's different strata, um, stratospheres or levels of, of NIDA. The, one of the common ones is what we call NIDA-3, where you have no relapses, no MRI lesions, no disability progression. In, um, in a large study looking over uh, seven years' time, pooling patients who are on disease-modifying therapies, in the first year you see a pretty high NIDA rate of, of 47%. But as you look longitudinally over a, a longer period of time, you see that only about 7% of patients actually have that goal of, of NIDA. So no relapses, no disability progression, no uh, MRI lesions. And, and the most common reason for failing that NIDA endpoint is having a, a new MRI lesion, but the other, the second most common reason is, is having a, a, a relapse. So uh, we see that despite adequate, really good MS therapies and some MS therapies that are really strong and effective, we, we are still seeing relapses that, that occur. Anybody know this term, the, the annualized relapse rate? We hear about ARR in clinical trials. It, it, it gets confusing. So the annualized relapse rate is what we talk about when we talk about effectiveness of medications for um, disease modification. And it's a, it's a statistical number. And it's the average number of relapses over the, the time, over the group of patients. So one of my professors in statistics told me a very, very important um, piece of information. And he, he looked at me and he said, Baker, he says, statistics apply to a population of people. Statistics don't apply to the individual. And if you really think about it, how do you have a, a half of a relapse? Or how do you have a third of a relapse? Either you have a relapse or not. So your chances of having a relapse, if you have a relapse, are 100%. Your chances of not having a relapse when you don't have a relapse are 100%. And so um, if, you, if you look at, at the numbers, the annualized relapse rate of one means on average patients are having one relapse per year. An annualized relapse rate of 0.5 is on average people are having a relapse uh, every other year. And then, uh, you know, and so on and so forth. So 0.3 would be one every three years, and then a, a lower number, 0.17, would be like having one relapse every six years. So when you hear these, these talks and you see these, these um, promotional uh, programs on uh, medications for MS, the, the end point generally is, what is the reduction in the annualized relapse rate? And these are the numbers that you're looking at. But what this also means is that in the clinical trials, even treated patients are still having relapses. 
Wow, here's a, a lot of information on, on this slide. This is a, uh, a pictorial of how we think uh, MS works in the body, what causes MS, um, how, how does the uh, neurological uh, damage uh, occur. And I'm not gonna go through all of this, but it's, it's set up here to um, allow us to talk about how some of the medications might work for uh, treating relapses. So to kind of put it all together, in MS you have a um, you have something that you're exposed to, and we don't exactly know what that is. And based on your underlying genetic background and based on your environment, the exposure to that antigen uh, triggers a misdirected immune response. So there's a cell that will pick up a piece of an antigen or a piece of a virus, and it will it will um, modify it, and it will uh, metabolize it, and it will present it uh, on the surface of, of its um, cellular membrane to a, another cell that's an immune cell, a, a lymphocyte, and it will activate that lymphocyte. And those antigen-presenting cells that do that job can either be uh, what we call a dendritic cell, or it could be a, a B cell. B cells are very potent antigen-presenting cells, and they'll trigger a T cell to become activated, and they cross the blood-brain barrier and they get into the central nervous system and they become reactivated again. And then they attack myelin and they attack the oligodendrocyte and the, the B cells can become activated and turn into what are called plasma cells and they produce antibodies that can attack myelin. And then this, in essence, will um, stimulate a, a pro-inflammatory micro environment that leads to destruction of the myelin, ultimately destruction of, of the axon, and uh, damage to the supporting structures of the, of the central nervous system. So depending on where that inflammation occurs in the nervous system, we get different symptoms of an MS relapse. So if, you, if it happens in the optic nerve, you have visual loss, and the visual loss can be subtle. It can be a loss of, of color differentiation. It can be um, profound. It can be complete uh, visual loss. It can be um, uh, uh, blurring. It can be spotty. Uh, it can be uh, wavy uh, appearance. And it can be painful. And when you, when you look one direction or the other, that the visual loss can be painful. If it... Um, occurs in the brainstem, there can be dizziness, speech disturbance, eye movement abnormalities, double vision. If it occurs in the spinal cord, it can disrupt signals of, of motor function, bowel bladder function, sexual function, and sensation. Not all relapses are created equally. So there can be relapses that are very mild, relapses that are mild, relapses that are moderate, and severe relapses. The severe relapses interfere with your employment, your activities of daily living, living can lead to hospitalization. There's some definitions here of, um, of the changes in the disability status scale depending on, on the severity. So a very mild relapse might, might not get you any increase in your score. It, it might be a you know, very uh, subtle sensory symptom that, that there's no objective evidence of, or it, it might be just some uh, loss of sensation in a thigh or something, but it's not enough to, to really impact your neurological abilities. You know it's happening. And it's important to, even though, even though it seems mild to you, it's important to note that and, and report it to your MS doctor. Uh, about a quarter of relapses are, are on the mild end of the spectrum. Um, mild to moderate, uh, you have about a third of them are mild, a quarter are moderate, and then about one out of six relapses are considered to be severe. So thankfully, uh, fewer relapses are severe, but severe relapses do occur. Um, and the duration can be different too. So the, the duration might be less than 30 days, short duration might be an intermediate duration of 30 to 60 days, and, or it can be prolonged, greater than 60 days. Some relapses have been known to last six months to a year. Half of relapses can lead to uh, 
impairment, permanent impairment in neurologic function. So in that, that slide that showed all the, the, the changes across the time period, you saw where those relapses were, would turn to baseline. But as time went on, you saw that some of those relapses, the, the individual did not get back to their, their baseline neurologic status before the relapse. That leads to accumulation of disability. So about half of relapses can lead to some permanent uh, impairment in neurologic function. A, a quarter of those lead to a, a bump of a, at least one point in the in the EDSS. And here's Kaya again. Yeah. I just think she's so cute. Yeah. So how do we use MRI in in relapse assessment? Really, the MRI isn't necessary, and and the the reason for that is that that we treat the individual patient and we don't treat the MRI scan. So if someone says, I'm having these new symptoms and they've been going on for more than 24 hours and we've, we have no other reason for them or that the symptoms are worse that they've had before for more than 24 hours and there's no evidence of infection or fever, that's a relapse. And so whether or not I get an MRI isn't going to help me. Uh, at that point, I'm going to make a decision on, on treatment uh, without getting an, an MRI. The MRI is, is useful, though, in certain circumstances if I'm not sure if it's a relapse, if I think it could be something else. Um, it's also useful in assessing if there are other parts of the nervous system that are inflamed or active that aren't presenting as that relapse. It gives me an idea about how well I'm doing with the platform disease or with the baseline disease modifying therapy. So if someone's on a medicine to prevent relapses and they have a relapse and I get an MRI and there are many different enhancing active lesions, I know that I need to change therapies. Whereas if it's a mild relapse and I don't see any new MRI lesions, I may not be inclined to escalate therapy at that point. So it helps prognosticate, it helps guide changes in disease modifying therapies, but it's not necessary for diagnosing a, a relapse. So, so I've heard stories before where uh, someone has clinical evidence of a relapse, but wasn't offered treatment because the MRI did not show a new lesion. And the reason it may not show a new lesion is we might not be looking in the right place. We The, the lesion may be too small. It may be a subtle um, enlargement of an old lesion that, that isn't readily apparent on MRI. So uh, the, the bottom line there is you, you treat the individual not the the test in in this situation. So, how do we approach the treatment of an MS relapse? So, if there's an infection, we we treat the infection. So, if it's a pseudo relapse or a fake fake apps, we treat the um, underlying infection. We also treat the the symptoms. So, if there's a a new symptom of MS, for instance, a, a, a spasm or a, or a pain syndrome that comes along with the relapse, we want to address the symptomatic management of it. Uh, if it's a new trigeminal neuralgia or electrical pain, we still treat the relapse. But we also want to help the, the individual with the pain that they're having from um, the, the relapse or the eye pain that's occurring. Or if they're having double vision, we may do something to help them with the, the symptoms of the double, double vision in addition to treating the underlying problem. Um, we can't forget about rehabilitation and physical therapy to address the neurological symptoms that are, arose from that particular relapse. We have to allow time for the nervous system to recover. So we allow for recovery and support uh, while the recovery is taking place. And then we can do things to reduce the inflammatory component of the relapse. So there are options for treatment. And generally, those options include some form of, of steroids or some alternative treatment to, to steroids. And then we think about why did this happen in the first place? How did this relapse come about? And there are certain things that will drive relapses. What's one thing that can really trigger a relapse? I hear it, yes, yeah, stress. 
So stress will increase the inflammatory mediators in your body and will drive that, that relapse. Infection itself can um, drive a relapse. So it's a cause of a pseudo relapse, but sometimes the infection itself can propel someone into a, a true relapse. Um, another thing that might uh, induce or create a situation where a relapse will occur would be non-adherence to the disease-modifying therapy. So that's one of the first questions that, that I ask when I see someone who has a relapse with MS and they're on a, an MS medication. I, I try to be nice about it. I don't say, are you taking your medicine or not? So we, I, I just say, hey, look, are you, are you missing any pills by chance? Are you forgetting any shots? Um, did you happen not to show up for your infusion a month ago? So, you know, or I'll say, you know, sometimes people might forget to take their pills as, as prescribed and um, most people say, no, 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 no. But that can be a reason. And if there is a, an issue with non-adherence, you have to find out why that is. Are, are people having side effects of the medicine? Are they having barriers to access because of financial reasons? And um, if they're taking their medicine, if everything is great in their life and there's no stress, if they haven't had any infections, then it might mean that the medicine that they're on isn't strong enough for their multiple sclerosis. So this is an opportunity to, to tweak their therapy and, um, and, and make a change to prevent further relapses. So what are the, the options for reducing inflammation or treating uh, relapses? We have, we have several, and I'll, I'll show you an algorithm, but most of us are, or how many of us are familiar here with, with something that looks like, like this for the treatment of relapse? So, so IV um, methylprednisolone, so it's a steroid that you take. Um, this is a, a picture of methylprednisolone in pill form. And, and that's an option. And this is a picture of Acthar gel that it comes in, in a bottle. And it is, um, if you allow it to warm up to room temperature, it becomes a liquid that you can self-inject either under the skin or in the muscle. Um, okay, here's a, here's a quiz question. What's the first MS medication that was ever approved um, in the United States for treatment of MS? I heard of beta seron here at Avonex. When, and and Avonex and beta seron. Let's see, beta seron was approved in when? Does anybody remember? Nine, I think 93, 1993 beta seron was approved. Well, um, in, in the, the 1960s, ACTH was developed and studied, and, and, and ACTH was the first medicine used to treat, approved to treat MS. It's been around for many, many years. And um, ACTH um, is used to treat, it's not a disease modifying therapy like the ones we're used to talking about now, but it's a, a treatment for uh, relapses. So in the in the old days, it was it was an IV form. This is not this is not to be given IV, but in the old days, people would come into the hospital for for weeks and receive infusions of ACTH to treat their relapses, which was great because you have people in the hospital, you treat their relapse, they get some rehab, uh, you get physical therapy, they get taken care of. But as the economics of medicine changed, uh, you know, people got kicked out of the hospital. Really, you know, so you have the baby, you go home the next day. Where you know, in the past, you stayed for a couple of days and kind of got your bearings. Um, in the old days, you'd stay for three weeks with your MS attack. Now you, you don't even get to go to the hospital uh, for admission. You get it all done as an outpatient. Uh, but um, this, is, uh, this is a more expensive treatment option. And with time, we developed some synthetic steroids, the, the, the synthetic methylprednisolone. So it's much more cost effective uh, to use. And some people respond, you know, a lot of people respond beautifully to IV methylprednisolone, but there are some people that are, are steroid non-responders. And there are situations in which you want to use these other two options. Now, I mentioned here, or I didn't mention, that there's another treatment called PLEX or plasma exchange. That's a way of washing the plasma and removing um, the humoral component of, of the inflammatory pathway. And that can be a treatment for MS relapses as well. Well, so the typical uh, treatment or the standard of care is, is IV methylprednisolone, usually about 1,000 milligrams or one gram per day, either for three to five days. Some people give a taper 
of oral steroids afterwards. I tend not to, um, and uh, I have my own reasons for that. I like to minimize exposure to steroids as, as much as possible, but some people need that. That's just the way their, their body is. Uh, then we have, in those patients who have poor response to therapy, they're steroid non-responders, something about their genetics means that their, their, their steroid receptor doesn't interact well with synthetic steroids, or those people who have, have side effects from steroids that are intolerable, uh, or they have access issues that you can't, you can't place an IV. Um, or they have geographic challenges where they can't get to somewhere to, uh, they're in rural America and they can't, can't get to an infusion center. Those are patients that we, we think about ACTH gel or Acthar gel to treat those uh, uh, relapses. Um, uh, oral steroids are an option. It's a lot of pills. So the, the pill that I showed you there, that's not the actual size. You wouldn't have to take that pill. But it's a 32 milligram methylprednisolone, and you could take 32 of those every day for five days. And that gets you about the same amount of steroids that you would get IV. Uh, the studies have shown that there is reasonable GI tolerability, but that's a, a lot of pills, and some people get an upset stomach with that. I mentioned plasma exchange. Um, these treatments don't do anything to ultimately, we don't have any evidence that these do anything to ultimately affect the final outcome of the relapse. It speeds the recovery. So if a, a relapse is going to last, you know, one month, you might shorten it to two weeks or so, depending. And, and so that's important, too. It's, you know, do you want to accelerate your recovery so you can get back to work, so you can get back to family, to those things that you, you need to be doing? So, but it is important to mention that we do not, at this point, have evidence that suggests that it ultimately affects the recovery at, at the, the end of the relapse. But it certainly accelerates the, the recovery. This I stole from um, Dr. Berkovich. This is a, a um, proposed algorithm for treating a relapse. So you have a, a new neurologic symptom, or we can say an old neurologic symptom that has gotten worse, it lasts for 24 hours. And you say, well, is there a fever um, or clinical and or laboratory signs of infection? Well, if there is, then you, you treat the, the infection. So when you call your doctor and you say, hey, I'm having symptoms of a relapse, the knee-jerk reaction on the doctors then should be, you know, do you have a fever? Do you um, uh, do you have any change in your urine? Do you have urgency, frequency, uh, change in color, change in odor? Uh, uh, and then, go, you know, we're going to send you to the laboratory and, and get a urinalysis and get a blood count and, and look for any signs of infection. Um, and and that's, a, that's a reasonable approach. And so um, if the symptoms persist, so say you treat for seven to 10 days, but you don't get better. So this is a situation where the infection has propelled you into a relapse. And so you evaluate, you confirm that there is a relapse, and then you have your, your options. So the most, in most cases, you do the systemic steroids, the IV, with 1,000 milligrams of methylprednisolone uh, daily for three to five days. And if there's no response to that, or there's a side effect to the methylprednisolone, then you consider doing the ACTH gel. And uh, the typical dose of that is similar to the, to the um, IV uh, methylprednisolone, uh, where uh, you do it for five days, but it's 80 units for five days. But uh, probably, we're under, if you look at the original trials, we're probably underdosing that. We probably need to do it for, for longer. Um, but it can be you know five to... 14 days here, but it can, it can even be given longer um, according to the um, prescribing information. So if, you're, if there's no response to that, you may repeat it, either one of these, if there's no response. Um, and if um, uh, there's no response or the, sim or the symptoms are disabling and severe, then you consider something like, like plasma exchange. Now, um, I, I want to point out that, that the... the um, dose here, the 80 units, uh, uh, this is a, a far less uh, exposure to, to steroids. Does anybody want to um, share maybe, not necessarily your own experience, but um, even someone else's experience with side effects of steroids? My, uh, my blood sugar increased. Okay. And had to be put on 
yeah. Yeah, that's that's pretty profound. So blood sugar goes up, take insulin. Anybody else have any? Yeah. Mm. So osteoporosis, bone density loss, yeah. Mm hmm Yeah, gained weight, yeah. 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 Anybody get hallucinations or or delusions or psychotic or no? Okay. Yeah. No one no one's gonna to admit to it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Energy, yeah, you get energy, yeah. I often invite patients to come over, to my, yeah, moon faces. I invite patients to come over to my house uh, and clean f with me because uh, they say that they have to stay up all night and, yeah, yeah. A lot of energy, yeah, too much. What about in insomnia? Yeah, hair growth in places where hair shouldn't grow, maybe. Um, let me think of some others. Bad mood? Yeah, irritability, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, more susceptible to infections. Yeah. Poor wound healing, skin changes. Yeah. Get tremors, yeah. Tremors can, can occur. Yeah. Yeah. Tremors. Flush yes, good, yeah. Flushing. Yeah. That's a good that's um I'm trying to think of there, there's a bunch of them. Yeah. Yeah, the benefit you're you're accelerating recovery, yeah. So you have to, but but so these are these are situations where you if you oh I you know um, acne yeah so you can get have bad acne breakouts as a consequence of it. So all right, so here's this picture again, and so you ask yourself, well, how do steroids affect this process? If, if you if you look at the mechanism of action of the steroids. Uh, it, it affects the process at every single level. So even at the nuclear level of reducing inflammation, but it shores up the blood-brain barrier. It, it causes these these autoreactive T cells to kind of shrivel up and die. So and it, and it happens very quickly. So it's a really potent uh, reducer of of inflammation. Here here are the um, the side effects here, and I, I stole this slide too. So metallic taste, insomnia, altered mood. Anxiety, appetite. Um, I think we covered a lot of the oh, GI distress, uh, heartburn. Um, oh, uh, we we used to admit patients to the hospital for their first course of IV steroids, and so uh, and, and I didn't really know why we did that, but I, I looked it up, and the reason is is that there is an effect on the heart in some people, so it can cause cardiac rhythm problems and and that was the reason that we always admitted patients in the past for their first dose of IV methylprednisolone um, now it turns out that when I was in training we would admit everybody but we never put them on a heart monitor so go figure so, uh, but I have seen people have symptomatic drops in their heart rate as a consequence of of, um, of IV solumedrol uh, so we talked about the diabetes. Oh, it can increase blood pressure. So hypertension, uh, cataracts. Um, you, you mentioned the, the moon faces, and we call that a cushionoid appearance. You get a, a hump on your back and moon faces. Uh, and then you, you, you nailed the um, uh, predisposition to infection and, and impaired healing. So uh, as a group, I think we, we, we got all of these. Uh, not that we didn't get them all, but we, we <laughs> identified them all. Um, so let's talk about so if you have those types of responses that are severe to the IV solumedrol, what's your, what's your backup plan? And, and ACTH is a reasonable backup plan. And it works in a different way. So it does increase steroids in your body, but it, it allows your body to make its own natural steroids. And so you're not exposed to the high levels of the methylprednisolone. So if you, if you look at it um, scientifically, you, you have 1,000 milligrams of, of, of methylprednisolone. And if you look at the uh, treatment um, with Acthar, it, it ends up being about 30 milligrams. So it's a, it's, a, it's a far smaller steroid exposure. So it's like taking one of those small little Medrol um, packs, which you know, has the four milligrams that you do six the first day and, and uh, you know, five and then three and then two and then one. So it's a, a much lower steroid exposure. So there's a possibility that with a lower steroid exposure, you may have 
less of those steroidogenic effects. But if you look at the side effects of that, they all kind of mirror the, um, uh, the IV steroids or the steroids in general. Um, so that's one mechanism of action. The other mechanism is that it may it, that, it, that it acts on certain receptors that are directly on on immune cells and downregulates the inflammatory pathway. And it's indicated, as I mentioned, for those people who don't respond to steroids, those people who have intolerability uh, issues or tolerability issues rather to steroids, or poor IV access or uh, geographic uh, uh, challenges. Um, it's given in the muscle or under the skin, so IM or sub Q. So if you have a skin issue, uh, this might be, not be a medicine for you if, if you can't take under the skin um, injections. Um, so in our in our bodies, we have a a an axis that goes from the, the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland and then to the adrenal gland, and then there's a, a feedback loop. So under uh, situations of stress, physical, emotional, um, sugar changes, pain, there's a hormone that's released um, that then stimulates uh, the release from the anterior lobe of the pituitary of this um, adrenocorticotropic hormone uh, that then goes to the adrenal cortex. And the, uh, the adrenal gland is a small gland that sits on top of your kidney, and it, it's responsible for producing all sorts of, of endogenous hormones, but it's, it, it makes cortisol. So that's how this works. So this is a natural hormone in your body, ACTH, and uh, under these situations, it, it kicks up in order to produce cortisol to help uh, reduce inflammation and uh, have uh, different effects throughout your body. So if we give this exogenously, so from the outside through like Akthar uh, gel, we can stimulate more of the body's own natural cortisol, but at far lower levels than you would see equivalent to IV steroids. So you have to kind of ask yourself, well, why does ACTH work just as well as IV methylprednisolone, because their, their, their effectiveness is, is the same, uh, with a, a, a much lower dose of cortisol equivalents in the body. And the other factor that, that kind of gives us a clue that there's a different mechanism of action is this medicine has another use for treatment in a pediatric form of epilepsy. So it works really well to treat a condition called infantile spasms, but IV methylprednisolone doesn't work super great with that. So it's, it, there's got to be a different way that this medicine works. And it turns out that this is the indirect way. So indirectly, you're creating cortisol that then ha does its job. Well, there are these receptors called melanocortin receptors. And there's five different subtypes. The, the subtype 2 is the one that sits on the adrenal cortex that uh, is stimulated that allows it to produce cortisol. But there's these others here that are on the surfaces of all these cells that we saw in that big slide with all the colors. And the action of stimulation of those melanocortin receptors by ACTH all results in a reduction of the inflammatory cascade. So we don't know for sure, but we think that that is another mechanism by which ACTH works. So if you guys now are asleep, um, so is Kaya. This is how she spends her mornings, all, all tucked into my bed there. OK. So here's some practical considerations. So um, if you feel you're having a relapse, ask yourself, is there a reason for me to have worsening neurologic symptoms? Is there something going on in my body? Do I have an infection? Kind of prepare yourself before you call and say, I've, I've run through the checklist. You know, no urinary changes. I'm not stressed. Uh, nothing terrible has happened in my life. I got plenty of sleep last night. But if you can identify a reason, it doesn't mean you're not having a relapse, but at least you can share that information and allow us to make um, a judgment call. Report, report, report. Don't discard it. Even if it's a tiny, mild relapse, um, it's important to tell us because it indicates that there is inadequate control of MS, and it might allow us to get an MRI to see if there's more going on than what you're experiencing. Um, what do you think the percentage of people that report their relapses are to the doctors? 10%. 10%, OK. That's kind of low, but yeah. Do you think, yeah, 5%, yeah. Well, it's not 100%. 
and it's not 5%. It's about, it's about 50%. Yeah. What are the reasons that people don't report their relapses to their MS doctor? Not sure you have one. Okay, that's a good one. Yeah, so, you know, but it, when in doubt, report. Um, a lot of people don't report it because they're concerned about what the doctor's going to do which is going to throw one of these steroids at you, right? So, uh, and, and you've had bad experiences with the steroids or side effects or don't want the weight gain. But I think if you recognize that there might be other options for you, then you might be more willing to report. Um, a, a high percentage of patients felt that, and this is based on a survey, uh, they felt that uh, they just weren't heard, that uh, they were discounted or that the, the doctor wasn't going to do anything anyway. And so why, why report it? And so that's on, that's on me, right? So that's something I got to be better at is hearing, listening, and, and acting upon, upon that. But if that's one of the reasons that uh, it's underreported, that, that obviously needs to be changed. Um, so then we, we rule out and treat infection. And uh, it, once we've done that, based on the severity and access and, and needs, we, we decide on some form of steroid treatment or ACTH or plasma exchange uh, based on that, that flow chart I showed you. Um, and then we, we reassess to see how we've done with this. Are, are things getting better or are they worse? Uh, a, a fair number of people on IV steroids will have a sense that their symptoms actually are unchanged or worsened uh, in the course of the treatment of their, of their relapse. So how do we do with our objectives? So um, we know what a relapse is and what it isn't now, right? All of you could recite back to me the definition of a relapse. I'm confident in that. Um, they're less common than they used to be, but they're underreported, um, and they're still happening. So even though they're less common, we still see that, that relapses occur. So only 7% you know, you know, uh, of people over the course of a five to seven year period will be free of relapses. So there's even on disease modifying therapy, so they are still occurring. Um, MRI can be helpful in diagnosing someone with their first attack of MS, and, but um, also can be helpful in assessing other things that are going on, but uh, it's not requisite for diagnosing a relapse. We treat the patient, not the, not the um, MRI. So in, in summary, the treatment of relapses are, are, are multifaceted and there are options that exist. So it's not just steroid uh, treatment, but it, there are other options as well as opportunities to think about how we're doing with our disease modifying therapy, opportunities for strengthening and rehab, um, opportunities for finding out what's going on in individuals' lives that may be uh, increasing inflammation uh, and um, promoting uh, relapse activity. So with that, I will stop my barking and uh, I'll um, answer any questions that you guys might have. Yes, Ricardo. Thank you. The lesions that one gets on the spinal cord. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's visible through the MRI. Is it also visible in the brain, the lesions in your spinal cord, or is that totally different from your brain? So there are, there are some lesions in the spinal cord that can extend into the brain because the, I, I, we artificially separate in our minds, brain, and spinal cord, but it's all an optic nerve, but it's all continuous. So um, there, there's a junction between the brain and the spinal cord. So you have the upper cervical spine and you have the lower brainstem, which we call the medulla. And at that junction, we, you know, we call it the cervicomedullary junction, there can be MS lesions that, that are present there. So, but it's, if you can have spots in the brain 
uh, you know, demyelinating plaques in the brain and then separate demyelinating plaques in the spinal cord and and, that, and that's where we get get the, the the name of the disease right so it's multiple sclerosis so it's different scars multiple scars in different areas but there are situations where they can be continuous with each other but that sometimes makes you think about other uh, types of, of disease too so if you have long long segments of, of lesions that extend into the lower brainstem, you might think about something like neuromyelitis optica instead of, of, of MS, and that's a different disease. Any other questions? Does everybody here know everything about MS? If you did, how, you didn't even need to come here today. There we go, thank you. I knew that would get a question. This is something I wondered about, if it was a coincidence or if there was a basis for cause and effect. I had a, a severe car accident around 2003, maybe, and uh, a big brain concussion. I was out for over 24 hours, woke up in the hospital, and you know, no sign of anything before that. And then afterwards, I started to get the symptoms of MS. And uh, been pretty symptom free, but I've had a couple of episodes since. And I wondered if there's any reason to think that that's a causation. So I, my answer is I think there is a cause and effect. That's my personal opinion. Um, and I think a lot of other MS specialists will say that that trauma, whatever it is, will ramp up the um, immune system. So when your body is attacked from whatever reason, it's going, it, it, it doesn't know that it was a car accident. You, you, your body may, have, may think that you were attacked by a saber-toothed tiger. So it, it, it hasn't evolved to know the difference. Your brain has, but the immune system is so ancient that it says, I, I'm being threatened I need to ramp up my defenses. And uh, all of those pro-inflammatory cells and pro-inflammatory cytokines will drive the MS. Now, um, I think there's a difference between does a, an automobile accident cause MS or does it cause it to, to relapse and become apparent because remember there's that preclinical phase where you actually have MS but you have no idea. So I think that's the more likely scenario is that people have MS, some trauma occurs and that trauma can be car accident, can be uh, divorce, it can be um, loss of a loved one, it can be illness, it can be surgery uh, and so you know, how many people have had a surgery and then they have a, a flare up uh, shortly after surgery. So. Um, so I, I think that's the, the cause and effect. Years ago, they, they took some uh, MS specialists from the, that were members of a committee with the American Academy of Neurology, and they locked them in a room and they wouldn't let them out until they, they had a consensus statement on this. And, and their consensus, consensus statement was, you know, automobile accidents don't cause MS. Now, the criticism of that is that, well, how could you say they did? Because once you say, if you say that, then that opens up this huge legal thing. So then everybody who has MS that's ever been in a car accident is going to, you know, call Morgan and Morgan. So I, that, that was a criticism of that. But so, but does that, does that make sense? Any, any injury, illness, psychological trauma is going to ramp up your immune system. So. Okay, not trying to change the subject or anything, but, uh, you know, we have MS, but we're, that doesn't make us immune to other uh, conditions. So are there other conditions that um, go along with MS that... Uh, yeah, there are other... Um, sure, there, there are other immune conditions that can be coexistent with MS because you're, when you have MS, your immune system is... It's, it's a little wacky, and it, it, other autoimmune diseases can occur as, as a consequence of that. Now, just because you have MS doesn't mean that you can't have other normal 
medical conditions too. And, and there's increasing uh, evidence and an increasing focus on the management and treatment of those medical comorbidities, which tend to drive inflammation in your body, like diabetes, hypertension. Hypertension can cause brain lesions that look a lot like MS, um, obesity, poor diets, and I'm forgetting, oh, smoking, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so, so, so smoking, all of these things can make MS worse and can make brain lesions uh, come about and can drive disability. Hi, doctor. If you see an MRI that has a ton of lesions, but yet the patient doesn't seem to have that many visual symptoms or disabilities by comparison. How do you interpret that? Is that like a death sentence of what's to come? Or is it possible to have lesions that don't affect you? It's, it's likely that you have lesions that don't affect you. Uh, the, the burden of disease, so the, the volume and number of lesions may predict future disability or have some predictive value, but uh, it, there's other things that, that predict disability more than just the size and number of, of lesions. Uh, and, and that comes down to some special measurements of, of brain atrophy, especially in certain parts of the brain, like the, the deep gray matter. Um, what that means to me is that those patients who have a, a lot of, of lesions but very few symptoms, uh, it indicates that they probably have a different compensatory, uh, they have different compensatory mechanisms in their brain. They find new ways to wire around those lesions. They started out with a higher brain reserve than someone who is more affected. Um, they, they don't have disabilities driven a lot by spinal cord involvement, so they may not have significant spinal cord disease but have more brain disease. Uh, my sense is that the more we learn about MS, we're gonna find that when you have a high burden of disease and you're relatively unaffected at this point, you might see later on in 20 years more of the invisible symptoms like the uh, neuropsychiatric manifestations, anxiety, depression, maybe some neurocognitive changes, maybe more, more fatigue. Can oral steroids be used as an MS therapy? As a, a, a disease-modifying therapy, we don't have evidence of, of that. We don't, you know, um, we, we just don't have any studies that would support uh, like a, a chronic daily use of, of a, an oral steroid. Now, there's some people that are on daily oral steroids for another autoimmune condition, and they also have MS, and so, that complicates matters when you're choosing disease-modifying therapies. Yeah. Great. Last question right here. Hi, doctor. Um, is science approaching the issue of cognition loss more because I, I'm not going to remember half of what you said. Yeah. So, no, it's, that's, and that's the truth. I, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you know, so you saw the, the, you know, when I talked about NIDA, which is no evidence of disease activity, NIDA 3 is um, is with those you know, the the core endpoints that we we classically look at in MS, like the relapses, the disability progression, and and uh, MRI. Um, NIDA four brings in uh, brain atrophy, and brain atrophy correlates with disability and and cognitive changes. And so, uh, you know, then we look at NIDA five, six, seven, and and we're looking for stabilization or improvement in in cognition. So yes, the answer is yes. So yeah, so naturally our brains get smaller, but with um, with MS it gets smaller at three times the rate of somebody who doesn't have MS, and the, and the treatment for that is is to be on a, a disease modifying therapy that stabilizes your brain volume, but also the treatment is is exercise. So we had a program maybe a year ago or so where we talked about how how aerobic exercise can increase brain volume. So if you have MS and you have your brain shrinking, if you do some form of aerobic exercise in six months to a year, your brain volume is gonna actually increase. So, but, but studies now are looking at 
at, at not only the brain atrophy, but also how that correlates with cognitive uh, function. So assessing cognition as a, as a, a primary endpoint. Okay, I want to thank everybody for coming here today. I want to thank the doctor thank for you, coming Stuart. here today. And uh, I hope you all picked up something from this, okay? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. All right, thank you. Again, we want to thank Mallinckrodt for doing this today, all right? Everybody give her a round of applause if she's not in the room right now. Very good.